How are you all doing? All right. How was how was lunch? How were those sandwiches? Terrific. Thank you, Bruno. Thank you, Nancy. That's all right. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Joe Bast. I'm the president of the Heartland Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to another one of our author luncheons. Um, I think everybody here has heard the story of what is the Heartland Institute. So unlike what is Jim, the Institute? <laughs> unlike Jim Lakely, now, Chris Roebling, a longtime supporter of the Heartland Institute. Thank you for joining us, Chris. Um, but um, Heartland has had some really amazing times the last few weeks. Uh, my, my state representative is here, Tom Morrison. How are you? All right. Every state has at least 12 legislators who are honest and free market oriented. Tom is one of those 12 here in Illinois. It's a small, lonely group, but it's really important. Um, so we, we've had some amazing, amazing things happen. Last week I was in California. Uh, if, uh, if you go to the website that we created for Climate Change Reconsidered, which is our newest book on uh, climate change, uh, it's called climatechangereconsidered.org. You'll pull up all the video of uh, some television interviews that we did and a lot of press coverage. Uh, we've been really, I think, lighting up the uh, online world as well as the mainstream media world with the work that we're doing on climate change. Um, there's a group called Media Matters. Some of you have heard of this. It's a left-wing group. Uh, its job is to, to take anything that a conservative group does, try to do counter research on it, and then pitch it back. Uh, to the media and to Democrats so that they can say it's been uh, rebutted. So according to Media Matters, Joe Bast was the most quoted global warming skeptic in the world for the last two weeks. Isn't that something? So I'm glad they're doing that research for us uh, because we can't afford to keep track of it like that. Um, our guest today is Don Devine. Uh, Don is an amazing guy. I first met him probably 30 years ago when the Heartland Institute was first getting started. Um, Don was already an old man then. Uh, so you can imagine how old he must be now. Uh, let's see, according to his bio, he taught Betsy Ross how to cross stitch. Uh, in 1892, he helped Francis Bellamy write the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and he taught Ronald Reagan how to swim. Um, so, um, but actually, Don is kind of, yeah, he's one of the, the great founders of the modern conservative movement. Back in the uh, 60s and 70s, he was active with all those giants at the time. Um, he was a senior advisor to then Governor Ronald Reagan in 1976 to 1980. In 1981, he joined the Reagan administration as the director of the U.S. Office of Personnel Management. And in that position, he helped cut over 100,000 bureaucratic jobs, and he saved taxpayers more than $6 billion. It's easy to talk about it. It's harder to do something about it. Don is one of the few guys who actually went on and did something about it. He went on to serve on the Cabinet Council on Management and Administration, the President's Commission on White House Fellowships, the President's Council on Integrity and Efficiency, and many other, I'm sure, very important posts. In the 1990s, after leaving government, he served as a senior advisor to Bob Dole and Steve Forbes. Before and after his government service, he was an academic, teaching government and political science at the University of Maryland and then Bellevue University. He's currently a senior scholar for the Fund for American Studies, an adjunct scholar at the Heritage Foundation, a trustee of the Philadelphia Society, and a trustee of the American Conservative Union. He is the author of eight books. Two of them are of interest and note among academics, The Attentive Public and The Political Culture of the United States. If you want to find copies of those books, they're on display at the Smithsonian Institution. <laughs> um, more recently, he's written a couple of books that explore public policy and freedom, uh, Restoring the Tenth Amendment in 1996 and The Defense of the West in 2004. The book he's going to discuss uh, with us today is America's Way Back, Reclaiming Freedom, Tradition, and Constitution. I know some of you bought the book and have already had him sign it. Those of you who haven't, there are additional books over here. Cheryl, I'm sure, is happy to take your money and uh, 
Dan is, uh, Don is more than happy to sign a book for you. So please, without further ado, welcome Don Devine. Thank you. Well, I must admit that's one of the damnedest introductions I've ever had. <laughs> and in my very long life, I might add. Uh, um, I, and I usually start off with a joke saying, thanks for the kind introduction. That's pretty much the way we went over it, but I can't work here because, you know, I didn't go over that with them. Uh, and I can't believe that uh, he actually did research where things he said that I did, I didn't even remember that I do it. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I, uh, one thing he mentioned about the Fund for American Studies, and since uh, they pay most of what I do, uh, I understand there's some uh, folks here from there, and thanks for coming, uh, especially. Uh, uh, but kind of what I'm known for, and uh, uh, Joe uh, referred to it uh, is that um, I was Ronald Reagan's chief bureaucrat uh, for the, uh, his first term. Um, I remember when he called, uh, he said, Don, I got a job for you. And I said, what is it? And he said, the director of the Office of Personnel Management, OPM. Uh, my son used to call it opium, but uh, I, said, I said, well, that's the, the head of the civil service. That's a, a, a funny job to give a libertarian guy like me. Uh, and he says, well, I got a good sense of humor. Uh, I said, well, what do you want me to do? He said, uh, uh, I want you to uh, uh, cut about 100,000 non-defense uh, employees, uh, I want you to reduce their bloated benefits, and I want you to make them work harder. I said, thanks a lot, gonna make a lot of friends in this job. Uh, and I always remembered what Harry Truman said, uh, just to be bipartisan here, uh, if you're doing a tough job in Washington, if you need a friend, buy a dog. Uh, so I bought two of them to be on the safe side. Uh, uh, and the crazy thing is we actually did it. I mean, everybody thought this is insane. You can't cut the federal bureaucracy. You can't cut benefits uh, from the bureaucracy. And heaven knows you can't make them work harder. Uh, uh, but we did. We did cut 100,000 non-defense. We did... Uh, Reduce six billion, which is sixty billion in today's money. Uh, it's real money. It wasn't that chimp chump. Uh, uh, and we put in a pay for performance system uh, uh, for the middle managers and the executives, and we did make them work uh, uh, harder for a couple of years. Although that has its pluses and minuses too. Uh, um, but in any event, um, of course, I wasn't doing a. a uh, anything much here. All I was doing is uh, what Ronald Reagan said. Uh, uh, and he was a remarkable person. Uh, just think of this. Every president in modern times has increased, I won't do too much Washington stuff, uh, what we call non-defense discretionary spending. That's what runs the government. It's basically everything but it. Uh, entitlements and defense. Uh, um, uh, every modern president uh, since uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson uh, has uh, increased uh, that. Ronald Reagan reduced it, not relatively, and it bugs me, very few conservative people on the right even have any idea of this. Uh, uh, he reduced non-defense discretionary spending absolutely by 9.5 percent. And you don't have to believe me, you look at Obama's budget, it's right there. Uh, he reduced it absolutely. Even including entitlements on the domestic side, Reagan reduced uh, 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 non-defense uh, total spending relatively. From 17.4 to 15.6 percent uh, of GNP, uh, uh, and 
Everyone knows the Great Depressions we have, right? 1929, uh, 19, uh, I mean, uh, 2008. Uh, the only time the stock market lost 20% or more of its value uh, over a two-day period. Actually, it was the third one, which nobody remembers. Uh, Anyone except Morris, who doesn't get a chance on this. Anyone know when the third one was? Oh, we do know. October of 87. All right, 1987. Uh, uh, in 1987, we had just as serious uh, uh, a problem, and uh, I heard Mike Reagan explain it this way. He said, you know, 1987, we had uh, actually the second uh, most severe uh, 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 crisis. Uh, he said, uh, my father faced uh, one of the three most uh, important economic crises and he did nothing. And it worked. <laughs> All right? All right. He, he refused. They actually came, they even told him all the stimulus and all that. They even told him they had to shut down the stock market. They told all his advisors, no, all the geniuses are there, all the economic experts. He says, no. He says, if you don't let the market go down, it'll never come up. And of course, that's exactly our problem today. We're still holding it up artificially. Why we have no growth? One other problem, regulating it to death. Uh, Heartland does so it's a good job uh, uh, analyzing uh, um, what was the result of it? Of course, uh, a lot of my friends uh, 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 say, well, Reagan increased spending on defense. Yeah, well, he said he would, number one. Uh, number two, he kind of won the Cold War. Uh, uh, I mean, that was a real war. You know what I mean? Uh, and number three, uh, as Margaret Thatcher said, he did it without firing a shot. Now that's how you really win a war, right? by not having to fire a shot. Uh, all right, that's what he did. But the more interesting question is why? The difference is that Ronald Reagan had a vision uh, and it was a vision that none, no other president had uh, 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 since Wilson, Woodrow Wilson uh, had uh, maybe to some extent Coolidge and Harding, but uh, he had the vision that the founders had of what America was right, uh, what uh, made uh, America work right. Uh, uh, and I go into this deeply in the book, and I won't uh, get into it. It's really uh, uh, not something you can deal with in a, a short speech. But uh, basically, uh, it, he said that his beliefs uh, were based on the Western tradition, which was based on the idea that uh, uh, that there is a synthesis between freedom and tradition, uh, uh, that one or the other has enormous potential weaknesses. Uh, uh, freedom without having an underlying tradition of custom and law uh, uh, can't work. It has no basis from which uh, a market can emerge, and it took a long time for true markets to emerge, uh, even in Western civilization. Uh, uh, and tradition, if it doesn't have freedom, A, can't be uh, true to its own traditions, because uh, uh, the opposite of uh, freedom is coercion, uh, uh, and, and therefore it underlies its own legitimacy. Uh, so both are essential. And maybe it's not even 
fundamentally important because Ronald Reagan said it, but the guy who kind of revitalized the whole idea of what uh, this Western tradition was, uh, uh, and I deal with him a lot in this book too, a guy named Frederick Hayek. Uh, 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 Joe was kind enough to mention how old I, I was. Uh, uh, one of the good things about being old is you were there. Uh, uh, and, and, and when I went to graduate school, the leading uh, book uh, was uh, about the fact that there was no conservative tradition in America. And it was accepted. And to a great extent, it was true at least in modern American history. It wasn't until Frederick Hayek uh, uh, published uh, uh, a book called Road to Serfdom, 1944-45, uh, someplace there, uh, uh, that uh, this even became a, a, a valid idea at all. Uh, fortunately, there was a guy who owned the biggest circulation magazine in America, uh, his Reader's Digest in those days, and he, he uh, excerpted it uh, uh, in Reader's Digest uh, over several weeks, and he turned a little academic book into an enormous bestseller. Uh, uh, this crazy new idea that freedom worked. Uh, I mean, where do you get this? That, that planning uh, is a problem, not a solution. Uh, 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 a guy named uh, uh, William Buckley read the book and it, it said it changed his whole life, his whole view. Uh, and Buckley, uh, probably one of the great personalities of my lifetime, uh, got a whole bunch of creative people together from uh, anarchists, I mean literally, not a libertarian, an anarchist uh, to a monarchist uh, uh, in a room around the table and and in trying to find some theme to put uh, uh, this group together, they really hashed out uh, 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 Hayek's ideas to put them in a more communicable uh, uh, way. A guy named Frank Meyer, who was uh, not just uh, a liberal or a leftist or a Marxist, he was an active cadre of the Communist Party, read the book and turned them from there to becoming uh, Buckley's uh, 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 right-hand uh, uh, philosopher. Uh, um, and Ronald Reagan picked up uh, National Review. He was overwhelmed by uh, Frank Meyer, and Frank Meyer was the one who taught him uh, uh, this idea of the necessity of freedom and tradition, this synthesis of both of them being uh, what uh, uh, what made America great. Uh, and I think the fact that this this idea uh, was the motivating force behind this recreated conservative movement uh, 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 starting in the 40s and especially in the 60s and 70s uh, 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 it led to Barry Goldwater uh, and, and uh, uh, these conservatives, uh, this formula that Meyer uh, invented of libertarian means for traditionalist ends. Uh, libertarianism is means, but, but freedom has no end, it, it's a means uh, uh, for traditional ends. Uh, uh, that formula put together the, the modern conservative uh, movement. It uh, led to Goldwater and the, uh, the takeover of the Republican Party and ultimately to Reagan. Now, of course, we're a long, long way away from that uh, today. Uh, um, and Joe that everybody's interested in the, uh, the shutdown and all that, and I'll talk about that in a minute too. But let me uh, kind of finish the, 
the main point about uh, what I think we have to do. We have to recover that sense that these are two parts of the same thing. Uh, libertarians and traditionalists, social conservatives and economic conservatives, whatever you want to call this uh, division, uh, uh, if they can't be together, uh, there's no way we can stop uh, this enormous uh, drift into statism that, that we're facing uh, uh, today. Uh, we can do it as simply a coalition, and for those uh, that can't see the other side of it, if we'll just get together to save each other's life, that's a good enough reason, I guess. Uh, but to me, unless there is a core of people who are passionate about both freedom and tradition, uh, we can't survive. Because when the two on each end who are locked in, when they're really mad at each other, you need somebody who can step in and show uh, why these freedom people uh, are totally crazy in the Tea Party today or uh, in, the, in the, the era when uh, uh, social conservatism uh, was kind of at its uh, uh, gestation stage. Uh, why, you know, they may not understand uh, uh, and may, uh, you know, not put as much emphasis on, uh, on, on free means as they should. They've got some legitimate kind of concerns about what's happening to the the moral culture, which as uh, Hayek, who didn't even believe in God, said it was essential to uh, uh, support a, a free society. Uh, when I, the thing that it was most formative in my life, Hayek wrote a, another book in the 60s called uh, The Constitution of Liberty, which is really a much more intellectual than, than uh, Road to Serfdom. Uh, and when I read the sentences on page 61 uh, of the original University of Chicago, interestingly, uh, in Chicago here uh, edition, uh, uh, he says, paradoxical, paradoxically as it may uh, be considered, the free society will always be a tradition-based society, as freedom needs a culture of laws uh, uh, and principles that uh, will allow it. Uh, I mean, you have to have a moral principle, for example, that slavery uh, is not a legitimate commercial uh, operation, uh, 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 or theft, or murder. Uh, so you need some kind of uh, moral structure. Uh, seems to me that that vision has to be put together again. I don't think it's there. Uh, I hope there's somebody in this audience who uh, can do it. I mean, uh, clearly, uh, even if Joe didn't emphasize that I'm too old to do it. Uh, 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 um, but we need, you know, more than another Reagan, uh, uh, I mean, what we really need is another Buckley, uh, somebody who can uh, communicate this uh, in an exciting uh, and new way. Uh, and the only way we can do that is if we have, as he had in starting this, a bunch of other people uh, who can help them do it. And to me, that's what I see our job is. We created a great system that understood that the problem uh, in political life is power. Ronald Reagan, in his inaugural address, said, I'm not cutting government spending primarily to save money. I'm cutting money to change the relations, the power relationship between the national government and the states and the people, uh, uh, quoting the, the Tenth Amendment. Uh, uh, 
Power is the problem, and the solution of Western civilization is to divide it. Uh, and if you want simple program from divine, what we need to do, it's to restore the Tenth Amendment. Uh, uh, we really have three choices. The greatest uh, revolutionary in America uh, was a guy named Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson uh, is enormously influential. In 1886, he wrote uh, a book, uh, an article first, uh, uh, about the science of administration. Uh, he had just uh, come back from Europe as a and a newly minted uh, PhD, uh, uh, and he said, I went over there and I saw how government's supposed to work. He went primarily to Prussia and he was overwhelmed that Bismarck uh, had created this welfare state, uh, have a retirement system, a health system, education system, uh, and when he wanted to get this done, he did it. The Iron Chancellor, they call him, he went out and did it. He said, Wilson said, that made me realize the problem of America. The problem of America is it divides power rather than centralizes it so we can do good with it. He specifically used the, the, the uh, specified the problem as the Constitution and the division of power. And the division of power, uh, which we get uh, from Europe through the Magna Carta, when they were snuffing out uh, the Magna Carta ideas in Britain with the divine right of kings, we were so lucky, a bunch of people kind of walked with, in the, the figuratively with the Magna Carta in their, their pockets and thank heaven the British were too busy fighting each other and then fighting France and so they left us alone long enough that we really, we were, we were such rubes we were out of, we didn't know that they still weren't running under the Magna Carta, you know. So, and then when King George came over here and tried to oppose, we said, hey, you know, didn't you read the Magna Carta? This is how we're supposed to be doing it. And, uh, uh, so we, of course, uh, broke away. That idea was the central idea of our government until Woodrow Wilson came around and said, this is the problem, not the solution. He started the American Society for Public Administration. He started the American Political Science Association. He was influential in starting the American Economic Association. He came back fired up with this idea and he basically convinced uh, all of the American uh, intellectual elite. Uh, he became president of Princeton University, governor of New Jersey, uh, president of the United States, uh, all under this idea that if you can get power together and give the experts uh, control, uh, uh, we can have a good society. Uh, and that, ladies and gentlemen, to me, is the problem. We've been eating away that legacy uh, uh, for almost a century now, uh, and today's problem is that we're at the end of the road. All right? The money's running out, uh, uh, and we put such a regulatory uh, circle that the top public administration figure in the United States, a guy named Paul Light, he's a professor at New York University, he's a progressive, uh, uh, he testified before Congress that the, the American government can no longer faithfully execute its laws because its bureaucratic systems are so tied up that we can't execute uh, anything they want. They're contradictory, they're, they're uh, too many layers. and. Uh, uh, and this is their guy saying this, all right? The problem is uh, that this whole scientific idea is wrong. 
Hayek said, and I even missed it the first time I read it, in the last, uh, uh, his book, Law, Legislation, and Liberty, was kind of the crowning one, the last volume of it, he says, when people look back on the 20th century, what they're going to be most surprised at is our superstitious idea of what science can do. Superstitious. I mean, what a great uh, way of looking at this. And, yet, and now we're seeing all of this coming. I mean, to me, the stuff that's coming out of physics and biology and chemistry is so exciting. I mean, I mean, we thought we understood all these things. We understood nothing about this. Uh, 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 Hart Linnigan does such a great job on this. All right. And, and Wilson, as I said, Harding and Coolidge tried to get back to a more normal view of the Constitution, uh, uh, but then this, uh, 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 we had some economic problems, and, and Franklin Roosevelt actually ran to the right of uh, Herbert Hoover in the 1932 election. Uh, he gets in, and uh, all the intellectuals tell him, we've got to go back to Wilson, and he does. Uh, uh, Every president since then, um, you know, partial exception here and there, uh, except Reagan came in and said, no, that's the wrong way to do it. This is the right way to do it. But we've been selling that out ever since. All right. Seems to me there's only two, maybe three things to do. One, continue the way we are uh, in constant deadlock. I mean, the reason we have deadlock is because the Constitution was not built to do all the things we're doing. And so we can either keep going on this way, keep adding new uh, requirements here, keep getting it more screwed up uh, through bureaucracy uh, and, and using simple-minded ideas for complex problems. Uh, 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 you know, when I was in graduate school, again, a long time ago, uh, one of the major books was called Deadlock of Democracy. I mean, this is nothing new what's happened the last couple of weeks, all right? Uh, the founders set it up so you can't run everything from the center, even if you could, which the Soviet Union proved you can, but even if you give all the power. But the point is, it didn't even set up that way. So you either continue the way you are, or second, get serious if you're a Wilsonian. Get rid of Congress, you know, get Senate go, House go, uh, 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 courts go, states go, uh, 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 or just keep Congress, make a parliamentary, but, but put all the power somebody, at least maybe you'll have a chance to do it. And of course, that's what every progressive intellectual has said, uh, starting uh, from Gardner Merrill, who was probably the top uh, guy. He wrote in the 1960s, uh, uh, the market is gone, the government's the only way to do it, but uh, uh, the problem is these people are kind of suspicious of us. They won't give us enough power to really do it. And of course, I, I don't care what progressive group I am, once I say, you want to really achieve what you want to do, well, put power either all in the hand of, of one house of Congress, you don't want two, one house of Congress or in the president. Well. I'm not sure if I want to go that far. Well, you can't have a chance of doing what you want unless you do. All right, so chance one, keep doing what we're doing. Chance, uh, possibility two, really centralize it. Or uh, number three, get back to the way it was supposed to work. Article 1, Section 8, all right, that's what it's supposed to do. All right, the Tenth Amendment kind of wraps up it. Whatever isn't given to them is left to the states, uh, the people uh, uh, individually. So to me, this is kind of simple. The problem is, all we got to do is follow the original ideas. I mean, well, it may be kind of hard to do it, but uh, the concept, it seems to me that's the light. That's what shows us what we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I'll end. Uh, 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 the formal part of this was my uh, last cabinet meeting. Uh, the president had me in to uh, uh, explain to the cabinet that uh, uh, we were losing the battle against the bureaucracy. We, uh, in the first two years, uh, 
uh, we got all the 100,000 non-defense cut in the first two years. Uh, and what happened, every year after that, it started coming up. Uh, so I was there with a big uh, uh, presentation uh, uh, I was showing the statistics, how each department was going up, uh, 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 you know, trying to say, hey, this is what we're supposed to be doing, we're adding them back. And uh, after it was over, uh, uh, President Reagan uh, was very quiet. And when the president is quiet in a room, everyone's quiet, uh, and everyone's starting to get a little nervous here. Uh, uh, they don't know if the president is going to chew them out for starting the heading back. Uh, and what he said was, you know, in my reading of history, and contrary to uh, media nonsense, he was a voracious reader. Uh, in my reading of history, uh, no nation has gone this far down the road to statism and has been able to come back. Now, you don't think that was a downer in the room. Uh, uh, but you also have to remember Ronald Reagan's favorite story. It's about this optimistic kid. Uh, I already got some nods from the old uh, Reagan people. Uh, this optimistic kid uh, that uh, 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 didn't think, you know, everything's going fine. No matter what happened, he see the rosy side of it. And his mother and father uh, got together one time. They said, you know, we got to do something about this kid. When he gets out in the real world, it's going to rip him apart. Uh, we got to do something dramatic because we tried what we can. Uh, father says, I got an idea. We're not going to give him anything for Christmas this year. She said, well, that's a little hard. Well, this kid needs a hard lesson. So the kid comes down the stairs on Christmas morning. He looks around. There's no tree. There's no presents. Uh, there's nothing. He says, what's going on here? There's no Christmas going on here. And the mother said, well, Dad and I have talked, and you're not getting anything. Yeah. He said, no. Dad, that's impossible. Dad said, the only thing you've got is in that room. And he goes in, he opens the door. And it's full of manure. <laughs> all right. He said, what do you mean? Are we getting manure? Yeah, that's all you're getting. Well, the kid thinks for a minute. All of a sudden, a big smile comes up on his face. He runs out of the room, comes running back in with a shovel. And he starts shoveling like crazy into this manure. And the father said, what are you doing? You're getting nothing but manure. He said, Dad, don't you realize with all this manure, there's got to be a pony under there somewhere. <laughs> so after Reagan gives this big down, uh, downer on not being able to come back, he, said, he puts his finger, I can just see it, I still get shivered. He says, but I want us to be the first. That is your challenge. That's your challenge. Thanks for having me, but that's your challenge. Thank you. Thanks, Don. I'm sure we all have questions. Jim Johnson, you want to lead off? Uh, Don, uh, I appreciate that you reduced the uh, federal payroll by 100000 uh, But something else that you did, which you didn't mention, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. And that is you planted a lot of conservatives and libertarians in the government. You sprinkled them in here and there with the help of the uh, uh, Heritage Foundation. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, that's a mixed story, actually. And I don't know how much I want to get into. But uh, uh, one of the problems in the early uh, Reagan administration is they we're too credential oriented. Every administration has been that way, so it wasn't anything new. Uh, so uh, I just tried to convince them that they had to, number one was that you're committed to the, the job uh, and not uh, 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 just have credentials. You have to have some credentials, but I'd rather have a committed person who is less effective than a uh, a non-committed person who's out on their own. Uh, 
I remember uh, somebody criticized the George H.W. Bush administration uh, 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 because they were only looking at credentials uh, uh, and um, I forgot to get off my story. But anyway, uh, 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 I tried to realize that what's necessary in a political appointee is being faithful to the president. And it, it was very clear in the agencies where you had good leadership, it worked uh, well. Uh, where you didn't, where you worked, uh, not so well, especially in the beginning. Uh, I, uh, yeah. I don't know if that really answers it. Uh, actually, you wanted me to talk about, I'll ask myself a question. Uh, all right, wh what do you think about um, uh, this latest uh, 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 thing with the government shutdown and uh, uh, the uh, debt ceiling. Now obviously uh, a lot of technical uh, mistakes were made uh, uh, from uh, Tea Party and uh, uh, other people who wanted to make a dramatic step uh, uh, against Obamacare and spending generally. Uh, but here's what I think folks like us have to keep in mind here. Just in today's paper, I read uh, uh, something that uh, in the New York, uh, Washington Post uh, uh, that, that kind of made the point. Uh, um, what would have happened if there wasn't some dramatic thing like this going on? What would have happened? What if uh, after the first time they sent it up, they said, okay, uh, we'll uh, uh, increase the debt limit and we'll open the government? Uh, um, well, I'll tell you what would have happened. We know what would have happened because Harry Reid, who really is a genius, uh, uh, when we came to the, the last, uh, before the last House vote, uh, we came and uh, uh, we, uh, Harry met with McConnell the first time, not the final one, uh, the semi-penultimate uh, one. He, he says, well, well, we'll have to open the government uh, and uh, uh, we'll have to uh, increase the debt limit. Uh, and I'll concede that what we really need to do is to moderate the sequester. Right. So moderating the sequester was the number one goal of the Democrats. Uh, uh, here's from today's Washington Post. I, uh, one of their top reporters, Zachary Goldfarb. Democrat, quote, Democrats hate the sequester because it's basically the opposite of their vision of domestic politics. They hate it. Uh, and keep this in, for the next time. And the Democrats' whole strategy is, for the next stage is to roll back the sequester. Now, what would, in my opinion, what would have happened if we didn't make all these mistakes? We did, but we kept the attention away over there. And, and uh, Nancy Pelosi also, uh, the beginning of last year, set the number one Democratic priority is to reverse the sequester. Now, the sequester has given us the only reduction in non-defense discretionary spending since Reagan. Not one year, two years, and it looks like, unless they cave on this, it's going to be three years in a row. Now, we've got the House, uh, but they've got the Senate and the President. And in the system we have, you can't win that way. But the fact is, we did get away with that sequester, and I'm convinced we would have lost it this time 
if we hadn't uh, done it. So even though this has hurt us, which I think it has, even though it wasn't good strategy, I think the bottom line is it was a positive. Uh, uh, yeah. Going back to the beginning of your um, comments about the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court ruling on the moral basis of combination of freedom and uh, tradition and I wonder why we don't um, focus a little more on what dependence does to character and to happiness and to you know the the essence of what a human being is because we've seen the videos of the, the EBT panic and the kind of reaction that human beings who have become utterly dependent on the government, the kind of reactions that they will automatically have when, you know, the government that gives everything can take everything away. Um, I think we don't focus enough about how bad this is for people. You know, it's tough when the kid's this big, he's watching that tube up there, that all those kid shows are not put up by us. All right, uh, all right, with the teaching them dependency from here on, all right? They get them in school, all right? They have eight years of them telling them this, uh, that somebody owes you things, uh, you don't have to do it. And they got four more years in high school, they're taught uh, uh, Somebody came up to Judge Bork, uh, deceased recently, but, uh, and said, uh, Bork is one of his uh, pessimistic and deeper pessimistic talks, uh, um, and I said to him, how can you be so negative because the only ones having children are religious people, so that means we'll win in the next generation. And he says, well, are you going to send your kids to college? The person said, yeah. Well, say goodbye to them. Uh, I mean, how do we ever, of course, then talk about movies and television and uh, music. Uh, how do we ever win anything is the question. Uh, I mean, we are so weak on the cultural side. Uh, um, and. I don't know any simple solution to it. Uh, good things happening, internet. If we had some real smart entrepreneur, we could probably get rid of the whole university system that we taught uh, online. I, I, I taught at a place called uh, Bellevue University uh, for 10 years, uh, and they were big into this uh, uh, internet uh, education, uh, and they hired me. They gave me a ridiculous amount of money for a college professor, that, and I redid the, the whole syllabus and everything of the Western Civilization course, which at this place was required at least then. But in any event, uh, it was in Omaha, Nebraska. If you think Chicago is tough in the winter, uh, go to Omaha, Nebraska. All right? uh, and I said, I'm sorry, folks, uh, I'm not going to stay here. And they said, well, how about teaching online? I said, oh, that, that's nonsense. I mean, how can you teach online, you know? Uh, um, it was the toughest thing I ever did. It's so much harder than teaching in a classroom. And the crazy thing about it, it's better for the student, especially the average student. It occurred to me after doing this for a while, the main benefit of online education is the student can't hide. All right? You're in a big, like this, like in a classroom, right? I mean, the one back there, I can hardly see him uh, back there, all right? He's hiding behind his hand, all right? I mean, uh, and it's the same thing in college or anywhere. But online, you've got to answer every question, each student, 
And the horrible thing for the professor is you've got to read all that uh, and react to it. Uh, now, of course, most of the professors don't, and they have tenure, so a lot of them can get away with it. But, but the point is that if you do it right, it, it can be very effective. Uh, and, of course, you can mix it. I've talked to a lot of... Uh, schools uh, since then are trying to mix it and they're going to be so but just think we can give people college degrees for five thousand dollars maybe uh, and no boarding you know uh, uh, people would always because I've been a professor uh, people would always come up to me and say what's the biggest advice you could give uh, uh, on sending my kid to college I said have them near home all right. All right. I mean, so you can influence. I don't care if it's Yale or Princeton or what. Keep them close to home. All right. You are their only possible hope. All right. They're not going to find it in the culture or the university or the teachers where they go. I guarantee you. And as Bork said, they'll turn them around. Yeah. I must stay on this a little bit because you and I and I think probably a number of people in the room came up through organizations like the Young Americans for Freedom and ISI. And there are, uh, I, I'm out of it far enough, I know there are some similar nascent groups like that going on. But uh, the millennial generation, to me, uh, is, is a big hope. And I want to hear some of your thoughts about it. Uh, the, this is a generation born, I, I think they date it from 1985 forward. And there's actually, just like the baby boomers, there's an older uh, group that really reached the age of 10 or 12, and the internet wasn't anything like it is today, and we didn't have Twitter and smartphones and on and on, and then there's the younger group that thinks the older group is technologically observed. But these are people whose formative experience by and large, uh, and I, I waited a long time, I'm an older dad, okay, so I'm a dad in his 60s with uh, an 18 year old son. Uh, My condolences. Uh... When 9-11 happened, and we were living in New York, and I'll tell you what, the, the images in my son's head and his entire generation, I want to be a hero, I want to help people from the bad guys. What a great formative image. And I think we need to find a way to get some youth organizations that were just as stimulating as the YAF and the ISI and some of the other groups, you know, back from the early 60s, you know, to the 70s at least, you know, a very critical decade, pushing back against overwhelmingly dominant left-wing influences, you know, and, and many of those folks were part of the Reagan administration. I think we need to seize upon the millennials as the generation that we're going to save from being overwhelmed by the Occupy philosophy and get properly oriented with their, with their generational experience and instincts. What do you think? No, I think, as I said earlier, we need a Buckley uh, who can talk to them. Uh, um, and and th that's our, our job, all of our job. Uh, try to find that person who can put it right. As far as the organization and ISI Books is the publisher of this, I uh, uh, appreciate that uh, plug. Uh, but. But what we have is, is just so minuscule compared to the establishment on the other side. And that's why you need the power of, of uh, 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 movement, uh, Max Weber called it uh, charism. Uh, there's some special magic some people have. Uh, and. Uh, we got to find uh, that person because we're up against such big odds. I mean, ISI and YAF and uh, Young Americans for Liberty and Student for Liberty, a lot of good things going on out there. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, and I'm not a believer in man on white horse, and I'm not even talking necessarily about a politician, uh, as I said, but uh, uh, we need, and that's why the Tea Party is, but all its mistakes and errors is a great thing. It's the most energy on our side of the equation we've had in years. Uh, and if they can get their act together, uh, that could help us uh, a lot. And all the people in Washington with the long faces and worrying about it, uh, I mean, they still got to remember, you know, we wouldn't have done anything if they hadn't uh, done, uh, if they hadn't uh, won the, uh, the house for us, uh, which they clearly did. Yeah. Uh, on your bio, uh, Joe didn't mention, on your Wikipedia bio, it says that the New York Times called you the Grinch that stole Christmas or something. And I thought that was a real compliment because it, it's <laughs> like being called a right-wing nut. Uh, which is well, I mean, what we did is, you know, we cut the 100,000, and, and frankly, most of the 100,000 was by attrition, not actually fi uh, firing people. Uh, but we did happen to fire some people by uh, at Christmas, so that's how we got that. <laughs> My question is specifically the last couple of weeks. It, to me, the media seems like our biggest enemy right now, and I'm wondering, like, even recognizing anything that most of the media does, be it the networks or the New York Times or as as Tea Party people and conservatives, I just want to make them like ignore them completely. Even Fox News does things that really annoy me. So, like. What are your thoughts on the media? Like, are they, they seem like they're manipulating everything that's going on. Well, they are. I mean, the, the, the media are absolutely outrageous. I mean, they've always been biased against us, so that's kind of a given. I mean, even you know, Hayek's uh, Road to Serfdom uh, talks about the intellectual being naturally against uh, uh, tradition uh, 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 and freedom, which is part of that tradition. Uh, uh, so, I mean, Hayek uh, wrote, uh, I don't know if it was in that book or someplace else, uh, all intellectuals are by nature uh, left-wing, uh, uh, and that's why there's so few of us. <laughs> uh, but, uh, uh, but the media has always been against us, but it's, it's comp uh, compounded by two things. First of all, this generation is much stupider than the last generation of, of media was. Uh, they don't know anything, most of them. Uh, and it's not all their fault because all the, the, the tube wants is them to say eight words, and that's, of course, all they know. Uh, uh, so, and at least the older generation felt a little guilty and, and wouldn't you know, totally miss the idea on our side. Uh, and, uh, and the other thing is the phenomena of Barack Obama, and that the only possible good news is that that uh, has an end date, right? Uh, uh, I mean, they truly love him. Uh, and uh, you're never going to get a fair play out of it, so you just got to have some, uh, 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 some things are like that. Uh, so, uh, media is a lot tougher for me to answer. Uh, it hasn't really changed fundamentally, even with the divi dividing up of the media. We're, we're somewhat better off, maybe, but... Uh, uh, I, I hate to say this, being libertarian, uh, I think we need the White House, we need government, in other words, to be able to have a forum big enough to get over the media. You, you said a couple of things, but one, uh, I already had a thorough dislike of uh, Woodrow Wilson for enacting the tax uh, law <laughs> and uh, knowing that he was an avowed racist. Uh, you've added to that dislike. <laughs> um, the, the thing that you talked about, uh, you know, with Wilson's um, philosophy about 
there being, if you will, an elite, a good man, and that, that will solve all our problems, high excess. That's the fallacy of statism, which um, uh, Milton Friedman also said, where are these angels who will govern us? Uh, the other thing, too, that, uh, that I would like to mention is that as soon as this debt limit thing was reached, the agreement, they immediately attacked the Tea Party, which made me know in no uncertain terms that they feared the Tea Party. Absolutely fear the Tea Party. Yep. Yes, sir. Don, with due respect, are we discounting too much? Even the residual will be uh, residual at this time. Effect of our Judeo Christian heritage on our culture and the potential of that that offers us for the future. Because there is a theory that that's what's going to save us. That even the young people now, because of their disappointment in what's happening, are only slowly coming to realize that there is substance in our traditional values. Now, that obviously, this is not a tsunami, it's not a tidal wave, it's incremental. You know, Hayek, when he first started the, uh, the Mont Pelerin Society, uh, which is uh, an intellectual group uh, started in Europe, uh, this mountain called Pelerin, um, when he first started it, he wanted to name it the Acton after Lord Acton. Uh, 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 because he said that, and remember, in Europe, most of people we would call libertarian uh, call themselves liberal uh, or radical uh, party. Uh, they were anti-clerical, right? And he said, unless we reach out to the religious people, and again, Hayek didn't believe in God, uh, unless we reach out to the religious people, uh, uh, we're never uh, going to be able to change things. And of course, Acton is a great uh, historian of liberty, uh, so it was kind of a perfect uh, kind of person to use to do it. So, and I, I agree, I think uh, it's one of the very few institutions that is religion uh, uh, out there that, that has this flimmer. They may not remember this, that, uh, freedom is, is essential to their theology uh, uh, as the, the truly central moral codes, uh, uh, but it's there. So you got at least a chance there. I mean, you certainly have a much better chance than uh, uh, in any college faculty room uh, or any TV uh, studio. Uh, um, I, I could just give one little thing of hope, and uh, uh, because I see I'm getting cut off here. Uh, um, I, I was. Uh, were you at the Philadelphia Society meeting? No. 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 Uh, there was a guy from Baylor uh, who, who taught at Baylor and also taught in China, uh, and uh, he gave kind of an amazing thing. He says, you know, in my class in China, it's a communist country, right? The, the all communist school. In my class there, uh, a third of the faculty is Christian and a majority of the students. Huh? That's, that's incredible. And of course they moved. One of the great things of my life was, this is 30, 40 years ago, my book publisher called me up and he said, Don, your book, uh, in defense of freedom was just ordered by the Cultural Affairs Office in Peking. I take credit for the whole movement of the, uh, China to the market. Uh, I don't really have All right, thank you, Don. That was terrific. Don is sticking around to sign books, so if you want your book signed, there are cards on the table. Uh, if you want more information or if you want a subscription to one of our online publications, you can fill out this card. Um, I want to introduce uh, Jennifer Pennell. If you could stand up, Jennifer. 
Jennifer is our new development director, vice president of development. Uh, so she, her job is to solicit and cultivate all of you. Uh, so please uh, introduce yourself to her if you haven't already. Expect to get a phone call or, or a letter from her. There is also a flyer describing two upcoming events. Um, they sound like really interesting guys, so I hope that I'll see some of you back for this as well. And finally, if you haven't made a contribution yet this year to the Heartland Institute, do it now. It would be great. There are envelopes on the table that you can put a check or cash in. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next week, possibly. Jerry,